Okay, our final talk uh, this morning uh, is uh, presented by Millennium Petrochemical. Uh, Noel Hallinan will talk about his research with Minicamp on the rhodium catalyzed methanol carbonylation, new low water technology. <coughs> Thanks, Steve. It seems how we're running uh, so late, I think I just put up my uh, conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, some new technology that we developed uh, in, in the lab and subsequently uh, uh, patented. Oh, yes, microphone. Which is. Okay, I want to talk about some uh, new technology that we developed uh, in the lab and patented and uh, have now commercially uh, implemented in our acetic acid manufacturing plant in the port, uh, Texas. The, uh, the dominant method of acetic acid manufacture in the world today is uh, via a process invented by Monsanto over uh, 30 years ago now. Uh, this was a uh, homogeneous uh, liquid phase, um, a continuous process involving the uh, carbonylation of methanol and, uh, catalyzed by a rhodium catalyst and an iodide uh, species to also help the reaction along. Uh, this is a very elegant, uh, neat reaction, uh, pretty high seed activity, greater than 99%, and one can achieve uh, reasonable rates under pretty mild conditions of uh, temperature and pressure. And the, uh, the uh, general principles of this process as initially developed by Monsanto are still valid today. Um, there is one major uh, um, limitation with the original process, and this limitation we and other acetic uh, acid manufacturers uh, have addressed in the last decade or so, and that's what I want to talk about today. And this limitation is the necessity for uh, large concentrations of water in the reactor in order to maintain uh, uh, rate and cal stability in terms of that precipitation. This slide here shows uh, a table in which we look at seven molar water and if we fix the rate as one and the catalyst uh, rate of uh, uh, insolubility as one, as we decrease the water from five to three molar, the rate of acidic formation decreases and the rate of catalyst instability increases dramatically. Thus, while it's chemically favorable to operate at high water concentration in, in the reactor, it's obviously economically unfavorable unfavorable. One subsequently has to remove this water in the purification step. It's pretty energy intensive, requiring large distillation columns. And in fact, this can be the bottleneck in terms of how much acid you can push through your plant, how much you can, you can actually purify by taking out that water. Thus, there's a strong economic incentive to be able to operate at this low water concentration uh, in the reactor, but to try and maintain this kind of rate and catalyst stability. And the goal of our project then was, um, was the, the commercial goal as presented to us by our business managers was to uh, increase our, the production of our plant um, by about 50%. And they said as well as doing that, we didn't want any major capital investment. Same reactor, same uh, distillation setup essentially. So to do it by uh, changing the chemistry. And what I want to talk about today is the kind of experimentation we did, which uh, mostly in the initial stages involved um, uh, using a batch reactor to look at the effect of water on this, this rate and catalyst stability. And once we had determined and understood this effect, to look at ways of, of, of reducing this water uh, de de dependency on rate and uh, catalyst stability. Before I go into or launch into results, I really need to back up and um, uh, talk about uh, some of the reaction chemistry of the process, particularly uh, the reaction chemistry as initially elucidated by Monsanto, who did a lot of elegant research back in the, uh, the early 70s. They found that the rate of the reaction uh, was a function of uh, iodide and rhodium. Um, neither of the, the, the feed components, and methanol or CO, appear in the rate as long as they're available at some minimal level. There's, there's Zero order dependence. Um, the 
reaction chemistry um, is fairly complex. One does not get uh, insertion of carbon monoxide uh, into methanol. Methanol itself is not active enough to undergo this insertion. Instead, there are a number of uh, dependent equilibria. Um, the first of these is methanol on contact with acetic in the reactor is rapidly acerified to methyl acetate, which in turn reacts with HI form methyl iodide. And methyl iodide is in fact the, the methyl form that undergoes a carbonyl insertion uh, with the rhodium catalysis to form this kind of uh, acetyl iodide species, which is rapidly hydrolyzed by water to form acetic and uh, HI. HI is subsequently cycled back to react with methyl acetate to regenerate methyl iodide, which is necessary to keep the whole thing going. This uh, is a very clean reaction. The only side reaction of note is called the uh, water gas shift reaction. The net equation is a uh, reaction of carbon monoxide and hydrogen to form uh, CO2, or carbon monoxide and water to form CO2 and hydrogen. So we get uh, two gaseous uh, byproducts produced, which uh, um, impacts our CO usage, which uh, we use up some CO in this side reaction, but also because of producing two moles of gaseous byproducts. We need to uh, increase the vent or purge rate of the reactor to maintain the desired pressure pressure of CO that one might want in there. So there are advantages of trying to diminish this kind of uh, side reaction. Uh, this next overhead is a simplified version of the two cycles, the acetic acid cycle and the water gas ship cycle, um, side by side. <coughs> the, uh, the active species in both cases is a rhodium-1 species. And I'm just going to switch overheads back and forth quickly here. This rhodium-1 species is a uh, dicarbonyl diodo anion um, cis uh, square planar. So in terms of geometry and coordination, uh, electronic structure, Ideally suited for the classic oxidative addition type, uh, type reaction. And uh, this is what happens. The uh, first step in the uh, acetic acid cycle um, is the oxi oxidative addition of methyl iodide. And this, in fact, is the rate determining step here. The first step in the water gas shift cycle is oxidative addition of, uh, of HI. Um, the only two species that one observes uh, spectroscopically is by infrared, the carbonyl stretches are the active rhodium-1 species and also a rhodium-3 species, which is down here. It's a tetraiodic dicarbonyl, also a uh, monoanion. Okay, on to our batch reactor studies. Um, these studies were greatly aided by um, the, avail the availability of online uh, infrared analysis of the, the catalyst. Uh, we could almost in real time look at the rhodium catalyst under reaction conditions and see what happens to this catalyst and correlate that with, the, with our behavior, our rate behavior. Um, this is a typical uh, profile of rhodium for a batch reactor run. Um, the total rhodium uh, remains pretty much invariant throughout the proportion of the rhodium-1 and rhodium-3, the two I showed you on the previous overhead. Um, in a typical reaction, uh, rhodium is introduced as rhodium-1. Um, as reaction starts and as the methyl iodide and methyl acetate are consumed, um, the concentration of HI starts to build up. HI oxidatively adds rhodium-1, gives you rhodium-3, so over time one sees this decay of rhodium-1 and this uh, increase in rhodium-3 concentration. And uh, this is the uh, same data at this time, just uh, displayed uh, spectroscopically. The, uh, the rhodium-1 species, as I said, is a cis species, so there are two um, distinct uh, absorbances at uh, about 1990 and 2060 wave numbers. The rhodium-3 is a trans, the COs are trans to one another, there's a single peak at around, uh, around 29, so nicely resolved in terms of, of you know, to uh, actually quantify the concentrations here. Okay, 
this overhead contains um, again, some batch reactor data, uh, which we looked at the effect of water concentration on the rate of acetic formation. Um, each of these data points represents a separate batch reactor experiment in which we use a different starting water concentration. The components of everything else was kept constant. And you can see this, um, this exponential dependence on water. At uh, pretty high water, let's say 7 molar or greater, there's really no dependence uh, of, of rate on water. As one decreases the water, you see this kind of really exponential dependence. And this is not new. This is already out in, in the literature. This is, kind of, uh, this is consistent with the data already out there. What is new, however, is the um, a plot for the same batch reactor experiments, this time of the um, effect of water concentration on the initial rhodium-1 concentration. As you can see, we see the same um, exponential dependence that we saw for, uh, for the rate. And if we overlay those two plots, got the uh, rate on this uh, axis and the rhodium on this axis, you see that um, I mean it, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the same curve. And this is pretty unambiguous um, evidence that the reason why the rate drops as the water concentration drops is purely a function of the concentration of the active rhodium-1 species, the species that promotes um, acetic formation. This would also explain why the catalyst is less stable um, as one drops the water. Because the less, uh, the lower the concentration of rhodium one, obviously by corollary, by corollary, the higher the concentration of rhodium three, and rhodium three species in, in general are much more prone to precipitate. The pathways exist via which they lose CO and form a neutral, almost totally insoluble uh, rhodium three iota species. Price here for poor organization. Thank you. That's the one. That's the very one. Okay. Um, back to the rate equation. I've uh, already seen the, uh, the uh, basic uh, original Monsanto rate equation. Based on the data we've obtained from the batch, we now write a new rate equation, which contains the uh, same structure as the Monsanto equation. But now we have a term which also implicitly includes the water dependence here, which is in terms of particularly if you're running at low water. It also contains an equilibrium constant, which um, uh, describes the rhodium-1 to rhodium-3 ratio. So now there's an, ex there's an explicit term in here that shows the rate dependence uh, on rhodium-1. Uh, you can see, as we go to high water conditions, this um, whole term goes to unity, and the rate equation at high water would simply refer to the equation as initially developed by Monsanto, who operated only at high water conditions where they would not have seen this effect. Okay, so we now know the reason why the, um, the rate is impacted by lowering the water is because we impact rhodium-1. Um, why does this happen? Why does the rhodium-1 concentration a function of the water concentration? Um, this simplified diagram again uh, leads to some possible explanations. As one lowers the water, one would expect the covalency of HI to increase or, uh, in terms of its uh, oxidative addition. Uh, it's, it, the oxidative addition is generally considered to be molecular in nature, and the lowering water will lead to a more, more molecular form, rather than ionic form of HI, and therefore lower water should mean a higher rate for this oxidative addition step to rhodium-3. Conversely, lowering the water here will decrease the rate of this, this reduction step, reductive elimination step, which is actually facil facilitated by water. So we're getting this cumulative effect that's going to lead to a higher steady state of rhodium-3, and a lower steady state of rhodium-1. There are two ways of attacking this problem. One could find some, as one lowers the water, one could find some substitute for water that would uh, take, take its place and allow the rate of this reduction back to rhodium-1 to not be impacted. Or one could find some way here of slowing down or shutting off this initial oxidative addition of HI to rhodium-1. In either case, one should, uh, the, the, the result should be a higher steady state concentration of rhodium-1. However, if we, if we go this route and try and find a, a substitute here for water, uh, we, we're, we're really just, uh, as well as uh, accelerating the acetic cycle, by accelerating the reduction step, 
and we're also accelerating the oxidation step, uh, which just happens at lower water. We're also um, decreasing our selectivity. We're increasing our side reaction. If we attack here and try and shut down or slow down this process, and here we're just shutting off the water gas ship right there, and, and increase in, in acidic process only, and actually decrease in our side reaction. And this is what we focused on, is to find uh, some method of, of, of generating in situ an, an alternate form of, of iodide to HI, um, a form that would not be involved in any form in oxidative addition to rhodium-1. The one uh, criterion or caveat here, however, is that, is that the form of iodide that we, that, we, that we end up with must still be capable of reacting with methyl acetate to regenerate the methyl iodide as, that is necessary to go into the catalytic cycle. So we've got a uh, two-fold problem here. Um, the most obvious thing that came to our mind in looking at this acid was, well, some kind of acid-base interaction to try and, and neutralize or form some other form of, of, of iodide rather than HI. And initially, we looked at some inorganic salts like uh, sodium acetate and sodium succinate to try and form the result of sodium iodide. And that worked very well in terms of uh, catalyst stabilization. Um, the, Resulting, so that, um, we essentially got rid of almost rid of HI, and therefore our rhodium one stayed almost in 100 percent. Our rhodium stayed almost 100 percent in the rhodium one form. However, the sodium iodide was not capable of uh, interacting sufficiently with methyl acetate to generate sufficient concentrations of methyl iodide to keep the rate going. And in this case, we saw high concentrations of rhodium one, but actually very low rates. We then switched to a uh, much less uh, basic species and um, zoned in on a class of compounds uh, shown here, <coughs> which are um, tertiary phosphine oxides, in which uh, R here is, can be um, alkyl or aryl aromatic or mixtures, whatever they're all. Um, uh, these kind of compounds have a number of attractive properties. Um, the, the PO bond here, the phosphoryl bond, is extremely strong, about 140, 150 kcals per mole. And um, because of this strength, um, it, I mean, it's a pretty strong double bond on character, um, so, so a, a pretty weak basis. Um, the bond strength here also means that this is not going to be uh, prone to hydrolysis, and the chemistry is going to be involved with the uh, nuclear felicity of the, uh, of the oxygen. Um, these species uh, kind of will interact with acids to form uh, varieties of uh, different kinds of addicts. And the kind of addicts you get uh, is dependent on a number of things, including the solvent medium that, that you use. And, uh, and here I put up one possible form that we generate in the lab, but there are many others. And for confidentiality reasons, I can't actually list the ones that we think might be in the process. But this is a, a two to one addict um, that forms with that uh, two phosphine oxide down. Molecules, one molecule of HI and some kind of a strong hydrogen bonding interaction here. As I said, the caveat here as well is that whatever this kind of uh, iodide complex is, it must be capable of interacting with methyl acetate to keep a, a steady state concentration of methyl iodide to keep the acetic reaction going. There's no point in getting rhodium-1 stabilization without uh, maintaining a uh, sufficient concentration of methyl iodide to drive the rate. Uh, these phosphine oxides uh, showed uh, uh, very encouraging behavior. Uh, this is a plot here of three batch reactor runs, and uh, which got time, uh, which have got the concentration of acetic formed as a function of time. Function of time here. Um, the concentration of acetic is plotted at, at molarity. That's to um, just more easily see what's going on here. The, the methyl was introduced as 0.7 molar methyl acetate. Therefore, the maximum theoretical yield of acetic would be about 0.7 molar. And if you look at Iran at three molar water, so this is the kind of behavior here. You see that we um, that reaction ceases well before, before we reach our theoretical maximum yield of acetic. That's because the rhodium-1 has uh, completely gone converted to the rhodium-3 form. And we saw that spectroscopy could follow that quite easily. A uh, similar run, except in this case with 7 molar water, and we see this uh, much better behavior in terms of initial rate down here and also in terms of overall yield. Now we're getting close to the theoretical. In this case, the rhodium-1, or at least the percentage of the rhodium-1, is hanging on much longer. If one then repeats the 3 molar water run, the low uh, water concentration run, with uh, 1 molar phosphine oxide added, we essentially get the same behavior we got at 7 molar water. So now we've essentially clawed our way back here 
to the, uh, to the, the favorable type behavior and we see a much higher water by adding in phosphine oxide. And this table here, um, which I don't have conditions listed for, again, for uh, my apologies for confidentiality reasons, but shows the effect of varying the concentration of uh, phosphine oxide um, on, the, uh, on the rate. The uh, first uh, uh, row here, uh, we've got uh, seven molar water, um, no, no phosphine oxide, and this is the rate we get in moles per liter per hour. And we get, uh, this is the initial uh, rhodium, that's rhodium one, almost 100%. If one looks at a three molar, a much lower water run, again with no additive, you can see the large drop in rate and as a function of the large drop in rhodium one. As one now starts adding in phosphine oxide in different battery reactor run, 2.5 to 1 to 1.5 molar, you see we start getting our rate back to the point we're here, at, in this case 1.5. We're essentially back to where we were at the higher water and no additive conditions. And if you look at the uh, rhodium-1 behavior, you can see it's the same thing. The initial rhodium-1 starts increasing with increasing phosphine oxide, and again, we're essentially back to where we were at the higher water, no additive uh, conditions. The percent methyl here is methyl iodide reflects the ability of the phosphine oxide, uh, or the phosphine oxide iodide adduct to regenerate methyl iodide under these batch reactor conditions. If it, if it is incapable of regenerating methyl iodide, or not at the same rate, as without um, um, phosphine oxide in there, then one would expect to see a decrease in this concentration of, of methyl as methyl iodide. As you can see here, there is, there is no decrease, it's essentially the same. So the rate of methyl iodide formation, uh, or, or methyl iodide uh, regeneration, is not impacted by phosphine oxide. This last uh, column here reflects the, uh, the rate of the water gas shift, the competing reaction. And uh, it's just a relative rate expressed here. It's one at three molar water and no additive. Here's we step up our additive concentration. <coughs> our seed activity uh, is increasing. We're, we're getting less of the side reaction. We still do have some. There's, there's always some water gas shift that we see there. And this is probably because um, the interaction of phosphine oxide with HI, we all see in, in equilibrium, there's always some free phosphine oxide left in there and probably also some free HI. So we don't eliminate it completely, but we do decrease it by quite an amount. Some more uh, infrared spectra, online spectra. Um, this uh, top plot is similar to the one I showed before. It uh, shows a run with a uh, batch reactor run with no additive. Here we see the rhodium-1 uh, species decreasing over time, rhodium-3 uh, species increasing. The bottom run here is at one molar, in this case butyl phosphine oxide, you can see and again, these overlap spectra essentially would maintain rhodium-1 all the way throughout the reaction. We also carried out an abbreviated uh, experimental design to see if there was any synergy between the phosphine oxide and the water, any kind of interaction, uh, in which uh, this plot here um, shows rhodium-1 stability as a function of uh, phosphine oxide concentration and water concentration. And if one did have some kind of interaction between the phosphine oxide and the water, one might expect to see curvature in this plane, and it might be hard to see here, but really there's no curvature, no evidence for interaction. The phosphine oxide and the water just operate independently. One can quote an, an, uh, a factor in terms of how much, how much phosphine oxide one needs to add to offset the adverse effect of lowering the water. And we found under batch conditions that for every molar water we would lower um, the concentration, we needed approximately a, a one-sixth molar phosphine oxide to get the same rhodium-1 concentration we had at the, at the run without additive. And in our uh, continuous uh, pilot plant and in our manufacturing plant, we actually found under continuous conditions the this effectiveness factor, if you will, is even better. It's about 10 to 1. That means that for every molar water in the reactor, we step down in concentration. We only need about one tenth molar of phosphine oxide in there to offset the adverse effects that, that one gets by dropping the water. <coughs> and here's the one overhead of actual uh, continuous data from our, our pilot plant. And uh, again, the conditions are missing. Um, again, for reasons of confidentiality, all I can say is that the conditions here were extremely severe in terms of what. Uh, if we had operated this under these conditions with no additive, our rhodium would have been uh, essentially 100% as rhodium-3, 
in order to maintain rhodium in solution in the process, we would have to crank the valve on our rhodium feed or make a vessel wide open or leave it wide open. Um, you can see here with increasing phosphine oxide, um, in this, in this is in a continuous process in the reactor, the uh, percent rhodium as rhodium one uh, increases. Now, one cannot use all phosphine oxides uh, interchangeably. Um, there is a, a range of, of a, and a basicity in these phosphine oxides. And in general, we would expect that the more basic the phosphine oxide, the stronger the interaction with HI, and the, the better the rhodium-1 would be protected. And as long as the methyl iodide would be able to regenerate it, we would expect that the more basic the phosphine oxide, the faster the rate. Um, the basicity is a function of the um, phosphoryl, the PO, um, infrared frequency. The, um, the, the weaker this frequency indicates more um, current separation in this, and hence uh, greater basicity. Thus, as we go down here to, to, to lower and lower PL stretches, one might expect to see um, higher rates. As you can see, this is not the case. We're all over the map here with low rates, um, high rates, whatever. And uh, this is because when we introduce, or when the, the, the side groups are functionalized, here we have uh, ethyl and butyl phosphate, for example, these side groups themselves uh, can undergo hydrolysis. And in something like uh, hexamethyl phosphoramide here, this nitrogen can, can be uh, uh, can, be a, uh, can react with, with, with uh, various other iodides to form other species. So one has to uh, exercise caution in terms of what uh, phosphine oxide is, uh, is used. And um, two minutes away, Steve. So. Um, what one always does in industry is benchmarks the technology against competitors' technology. Um, in the last decade, um, the three major U.S. producers of acetic, who are BP, Celanese, and ourselves, have all introduced uh, new and independent low water technologies. And we looked at uh, the other technologies uh, under the kind of conditions we use in our batch reactor. The batch reactor results in conditions that are very subjective to where they're done and, and, and et cetera. So um, as, to how, as to how much one can compare uh, from one, from one uh, technology to another is debatable. But in this overhead here, first we have with the rhodium callus with no additive, fixing this is a rate of one, and then in our process with added phosphine oxide, it's an increase in rate. Um, rhodium with lithium iodide added, which is Selenese process, we, we, we did not see any increase, any, any real benefit. Um, BP's process with iridium, iridium ruthenium, we saw even lower rates. So, but what has worked, that's, um, that's what we got. And rapidly, uh, conclusions. Um, the, uh, the key ingredient here was the availability of online infrared to allow us to correlate the, um, the rate with the, with, with the callous behavior. And from that, we quickly developed an understanding of how one could, could, could offset this dependence of, uh, of rate and callous stability um, on water and determine what kind of additives one could throw in there to, to reduce or, or to just uh, get rid of this, um, this uh, possibility. Um, this process has been in the plan now since uh, early 1988. The initial business goal was to increase our production rate by 50%. Our, our nameplate, our boilerplate capacity two years ago was 800 million. We wanted to go to 1.2 billion. We're currently at 1 billion. Um, restricted only by the availability of feedstocks. The chemistry is in place and working and uh, ready to go further when the feedstocks become available. Um, finally, I'd like to acknowledge my colleague, uh, Jim Henningkamp, who was the, really the major driving force in this whole process from hands-on construction of the batch reactor to the chemistry to design of the continuous reactor. And I'd also like to uh, thank Steve here as well, who is predominantly involved in vinyl acid in our company. He frequently crossed the lines and used his kinetic expertise to help us with rates and with experimental designs, etc. Thank you. Time for a couple more questions. Okay. Now, you initially said that water was necessary for two reasons. One was the react rate, rate right. and the other was the calcibility. The calcibility. Right. Prevent the precipitation. Precipitating, right. Okay, then later on you told us that water and the additive work independently. So, how do we decrease the water with, with the additive and not increase our catalyst precipitation? Um, because we're keeping, we're keeping our rhodium in the form that is not prone to precipitate, the rhodium-1 form. So the water is basically there to 
modify the... Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, if one lowers the water, then uh, that tends to back up rhodium in a form that is prone to precipitate. detrimental effect of water. So, if, I mean, phosphine oxide doesn't um, explicitly take the place of water because it's, it's not involved in that part of the cycle, it, it, but it does replace its effect. One more. The uh, oxidative addition transforms the dicarbonyl, which is a uh, cis and trans in the square plane of a uh, configuration, into the dicarbonyl, which is uh, uh, than uh, octahedral, but exclusively trans. Is that an explanation for that? The, the, the first oxidation of methyl iodide? The, the, the result is only trans. The two COs are only in trans position, whereas before, when they were square planar, you, the infrared showed it was cis and trans. Well, the, the, the trans species I showed was not, well, that, was, that was not, that was the result of oxidation of HI, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, 